Sunday night. Look at you and me. Look, Look at, at us. Sunday night. This is nice. You guys hanging out on Sunday night. Is that a coffee? It, you know, it is. I thought I should probably keep myself up. You know, like I yeah. figure if I'm, if I'm going to sit down and I'm going to talk to Dr. J.P. Getty and on a Sunday night, I better be ready. That's, 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 you know, I've sat down with you over dinner before. <laughs> I know I better be ready. So I'm, uh, we're, we're live. We're live. And uh, I want to say welcome. Thank you. Uh, Dr. J.P. Gedeon, who is a executive coach, uh, a keynote speaker, uh, a psychologist, psych psychotherapist. Psychotherapist. Yeah, psychologist. Yeah. Psychologist. Well, not, not a psychotherapist, but I, they go together. And the CEO and founder of, of Transformative Directions. Can you tell me what Transformative Directions is? Yeah, it's uh, basically like a boutique consultancy firm where we help corporations and governments and institutions that are undergoing transformations, whether it be for leadership or for mandate or for culture or for strategy, anything that requires like wholesale shifting. So if you're going straight and you need to turn right, uh, we help you do that, basically. So part of that is everything that you just mentioned also. No, it's very, it's, you know, when I, 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 somebody asked me, we were going to, I was speaking with you tonight, and they were asking me what it is that the Transformative Directions is, and my answer was, well, I, I kind of hope it's what I get to do one day. So I, when, oh, yeah. I grow, when I, I grow up, I want to be, I want to be like, like JP, because. Oh, fun, thanks, I, man. That's yeah, very no, sweet. There's always room for you in Transformative Directions. Oh, man. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, like, doing some of the, the new work that, that I've been doing the last few months, um, you're somebody, when I look at, at the work that you're doing, you're a model for, for what I hope to be able to do one day. So uh, I, I think it's some great stuff that you're pulling off. And, and you're going to do it, man. You're going you're gonna to climb the mountain and take it over. <laughs> you're, you're very you're kind. This week, last week uh, began Passover for the Jewish people. This week, Palm Sunday was today, and we're headed towards Easter next week. And in my world, or the world that I inhabited for, for quite a long time as a clergyman, um, I, uh, this week was the week, right? Like very busy. I remember one church that I served that had 18 services. Um, wow. week. and it was a grind. Uh, but the number of people we encountered during that week from all these different walks of life, uh, you know, that we, we didn't see during the rest of the year because we weren't always quite open and available the same way. Right. And this year, as well as last year, um, for much of the world, and especially where we live here uh, in Toronto, or just north of Toronto for you, um, people aren't able to do that in the same way. Some churches might get a small gathering here, some synagogues might have a, a handful there, but it's very different. And I was talking to you a couple of weeks ago about both what this is going to do to the psychology of the individual uh, religious people who are, are used to living their lives in a particular way, being separated from their communities, as well as the, the, the psychology of the institution that is having to adapt to a world it never imagined. Um, uh, you know, uh, what I wanted to ask you about, having kind of framed it that way, um, is as somebody, you, you're somebody who, who grew up with a faith life, but um, what do you think it's really doing to folks um, to not be able to connect and gather and be spiritually nourished and fed the way uh, they have for most of their lives and for for most of the way the these communities have functioned? Yeah, that's, you know what, that's a good question. And the answer is, uh, well, the short answer is it's hurting folks. Um, I can tell you that when I'm working with my clients, although I'm not working with them in uh, religious context. I'm working with them in corporate contexts. Yeah. What I notice more and more is that there's this rising, well, I'm not sure it's rising. It's been rising forever, but now it's coming to a head culture of individualism going on where it's all on me and it's all about me and it's, it's, all, it's basically all on me. And the whole notion of us isn't in the room. The notion of community isn't in the room. The notion of community of practice is just words. The notion of community of safety, never mind beloved community. Oh, please, you know, like we're, we're, we're way beyond that. And th there's a sense of aloneness. I don't want to say loneliness as much as aloneness, where the they, there's loneliness and aloneness. 
Well, you know, there's there's a sense about loneliness of 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 just wanting other people around because I want company and I want companionship. But there's this, you know, you can be in company and still alone, right? Yes. Still separated, still insulated. And I'm seeing that more and more and more with my clients. As a matter of fact, I, I just finished working with a huge client just this week. I didn't finish working with them. I'm in the middle of it. And uh, I had to advocate three, four times for various groups to get together and form a community of practice where they will meet literally weekly and talk to each other and create a space of psychological safety so they can share what's going on and find strength in each other. Well, that sounds a lot like what you're just talking about. Yeah. And the fact that it's disappearing, um, and I think it's disappearing for a number of reasons. You know, the whole individualism that has built itself into the Western culture is, is, is just rising. And, and the interlinkages, we've forgotten what it means to be us. It's forgotten what it means to be we. We've forgotten the strength we get from just being together. We've forgotten the net we create from being connected. We forget the integration and the openness and the learning and the development that we can get. And never mind the fulfillment and the joy and the laughter and the inspiration. It's all done now by uh, appointment and for short bursts of time. And a lot of people just kind of do it a little bit. Then you're encroaching on my time. It's time for me to go home. Um, and I notice the effects. I notice the effects in people's outlooks. I notice it in people's demeanor, in their wisdom, in their, re in their reasoning, and in just their capacity to deal resiliently with some of the crap that we have to live through today. I mean, the pandemic is well, it, that's a it punch is, in the face. It is. And, and the, the rise in both loneliness and aloneness, frankly, um, I, I see it everywhere. Um, in, in, in all aspects of, of coaching and um, I'm hearing about it a lot from I have some, some clergy coaching clients so taking care of communities and, and trying to find ways um, to when, like for, I, have a, I have a client who's a, new, a priest at a new church and for the last eight months he hasn't been able to visit any of the people he's pastorally uh, connected to he's done a lot of phone calls Sent a lot of video chats, um, but trying to make a real life connection uh, when we're living in an exclusively digital world. Are you, what do you see in your professional life? I, I, I know you've you've moved a lot of your business uh, online. Uh, you're doing a lot of online coaching now. Um, has it changed the nature of relationships? Has it changed the nature of relationships? I think you know. I think people worry that it's changed the nature of relationships. And for my coaching business, I do meet a lot of people just like this. This is, this is how we talk. Yeah. And I've had to learn to read the cues in a different way. I've had to look for, you know, body cues and reactions in a way that's a little bit more intentional because when you're in the room, you can kind of feel it in the air. Um, but what I found is that a lot of people are saying to me when, when, when we're working together, so I have a team. I don't know how to connect to my team. Like, you know, I, I'm on Zoom calls all day long and I'm worried that we're not connecting and I'm worried that the culture that we've built is going to fall apart. And how do I do that? And it's an interesting question because the answer is actually really kind of simple. You know, it's, you know, if, if you are away from your loved ones, from your children, from your partner, from whomever is important to you for a length of time, what would you do? Well, they're like, well, I would call them and I would send them things and I would write them stuff. So what's the difference? Mm -hmm. So you know the answer. But again, back to the disjointed individual world we live in, it doesn't occur to them that the same things that work in one context can work in another context. So I think the challenge that this world has brought us is not so much I gotta do something different, but I think I gotta get down to the root and integrate everything that I know works and start doing those things with people I didn't used to do it with. I think the thing I continue to see in this pandemic world is that um, things have been, you know, the, the temperature has been turned up in different places where you'll have uh, the best of humanity is being shown in lots of ways and the commitment to, to taking care of people. Uh, I, I have a number of friends and, and relatives who are nurses and, and what they give back to their communities right now is, is, right. is beautiful. 
Um, I think it also can magnify, uh, you know, the worst, the worst of us. Um, as we, as I hear more and more stories, um, of being, people being trapped in situations that they, they can't make their, their way out of. Mm-hmm. Um, as, as, as people are, are trying to, to figure out a new way of being, and you're working with people online, um, do, you see, um, do you see a future for, for communal gatherings, um, whether it is church gatherings or, uh, or, or, or corporate gatherings, uh, to continue to go in this way, which is not a, a, always a, 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 a real flesh and blood situation. Um, do you see, like, do you see us being able to, to continue to function this way um, with, with this much of a digital world? Um, or, or do you think over time that, that this just starts to break down on us? Yeah, I, I, I think it starts to break down. I think we need each other. I think we need to be in rooms together. I think we need to embrace each other and shake each other's hands and, and, and have a martini and laugh and you know all that kind of stuff across the same table. I think you know the human brain has evolved over millennia to have uh, you know social functions and social centers to connect literally. And although computer mediated connection might help, uh, it's actually nothing in comparison to in-person connection and, and how our brain fires for that. So I think we are physically <laughs> wired to be together. And uh, one way or another, that's got to come back somehow. Now, I don't think that we're going back to 2019, though. So I don't necessarily think that the workplace is going to go back to everybody goes to work every day and, you know, everybody has a desk and all that, that kind of stuff. I think there's an opportunity for industry to move more virtual such that the work is no longer nine to five. Like the work is project-based. It has to get done by Thursday at three and people are handing things off to one another in a virtual format, which would actually allow for greater integration of both sides of our lives. So if I have a dentist appointment, I can go. If my little one is sick, I'll go get them from school, bring them home, take care of them. I'll just do work tonight as long as I'm getting things done by Thursday as opposed to this nine to five kind of an approach. Now, if we did that, that would open the door to being able to connect with each other more on a human level when we do talk like this or on the phone or go and meet for a coffee or, or, or whatever it is. Um, I think that's likely to be the future if yeah. it's done right, right? If it's not done right, all that'll happen is you'll end up with a bunch of people who only see each other over Zoom. They end up being cogs in a machine. They get no real interrelation because we only know each other kind of like this. Well, this is this right? is this is the you know I was a big uh, Wachowski brothers fan when I was young. The Matrix, you know, like uh, like you do start to feel once in a while as though you're you are just a, you know a cog in a wheel, and you're right. you know what do you really belong to if you don't if you don't belong to anything in person. Um, right. You know, and I've been talking to different people um, over the last number of weeks, and, and some of the commonalities I see are people who are like big, big gym rats. They're the folks who love going to the gym, spending time working out. <laughs> are they rats? Is that is that, is that yeah. the term? Yeah, I know lots. Of them. <laughs> okay. Um, you got your, uh, you got all your yoga people, like folks who like to gather for for stuff like that. And funny yeah. enough, I hear in this, like the same breath, church and synagogue and mosque people, um, because the kinds of places you found community, those kind of those kind of gatherings where you didn't have to be invited, but you could show up. Um, you might have right. to pay a fee if it's a gym membership, or maybe not, but or maybe not at a church. But those those kind of things, and um, I think that. Um, the absence of that for such a long time and the digitization of everything is going to make some of these institutions and clubs and things like that um, quite unrecognizable a few years from now. Um, because uh, I, everything I'm hearing um, is, that, uh, is that even for the, in the big urban centers like Toronto, um, it's going to be a long time. Uh, like e- even on the other side of, of what it'll be like for rural Ontario, um, big mass gatherings, you know, people who I, I knew were planning for their, their weddings for 20, late 2021, early 2022 are just uh, changing their plans entirely. Yeah, uh, summer now, yeah. Yeah. 
I, I did exactly what I knew I would do when I started talking to you. I, I got I got down a rabbit hole on something that I found interesting because when I talk to you, I always want to ask more questions. So I'm going to bring myself back for a second, um, All right. just to where the, the the questions were. Because what I wanted to ask you a little bit about is somebody who's a coach and a speaker, um, somebody who who's who is running uh, a leadership and a trend a transformative leadership training uh, 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 way, way way about your business. Um, you're also somebody who who grew up in a in a religious upbringing. Um, you're oh, somebody yeah. who, and from and I know you a little bit, so um, I know that it was it, it was a it was very in your life, right? Like it was it was right in your face. Um, mm-hmm. And your faith has has changed and transformed in different ways over the years. But I wanted to hear how, um, as a man who who grew up with a pretty significant faith life, what is it like to 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 wield in the world of psychology? Um, as, as someone who, who comes from, from that particular background, um, on top of, of, of a theological one, because having talked to you, I know you, uh, you can dance in those circles as well. What's it like? Um, I find that if you hang out and think about them long enough and don't get wrapped up in the traditional boundaries that are set down on them by the orthodoxy, whether it be the psychological orthodoxy or the religious orthodoxy, you start to find that they talk to one another. Hmm. You start to find that they inform one another and one highlights and illuminates the truths of the other and back and forth. And you start to find a degree of, I think unity is the word, in multiple discourses. So, I mean, in transformative stuff, I have to talk to multiple discourses all the time. So I'm constantly reading things in various sciences, not just psychology as well, sociology and education and philosophy and biology and chemistry. And like, I I kind of read a little bit of everything that comes my way, a lot of history stuff, um, as well as things that might be belief systems oriented, whether they're theological or just, you know, the mechanics of how people believe. And so I'm lucky that I get to see all that. But when you start to to read all that, you really get to see that there is a bit of a unity in the universe, that there are patterns in one discipline that highlight or shed light on patterns in another. And what you know to be true over here highlights something that is true over there, even if you didn't happen to know that to be true until you start drawing bridges. So I find that the intersection is really enriching, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's only enriching to people who are not dug into the ground such that they feel they have to defend one over the others. It has to be a defenseless, open, uh, investigative, exploratory, even a spiritual process to just really see what the world might have to offer, as opposed to trying to impose on the world what I think it needs to be. I got to get you come talk to a few more churches about that. That's uh, (laughs) a lot of sense to me, I'll tell you. I will tell you that makes a lot of sense to me. You, um, at one point, um, you were telling me about it. I'm, I, I'd love you to share a little bit about this because as a part of a, a church context at one point, you had, you had done some work at setting up some, some uh, lay counseling pro- programs. Could you? I did. I have a lot of folks in my network who, uh, who function in church circles. And this is kind of one of those kind of the, the holy grail things that, that people talk about, like setting up a lay counseling program in your church. Because if you can pull that off in, in a church or synagogue context where the people are taking care of other people, like I am my right. brother keeper kind of thing, um, and you have opportunities for professional counseling kind of more at the core, um, tell me about what you guys did because it's the holy grail. So uh, we ended up, creating a, 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 a program and we pulled from other already existing programs. So we sort of riffed on stuff that was already out there from various places to create a program that was lay counseling. So people who would go out into the community and take care of people. So people who were distressed, but maybe not so distressed that they immediately needed professional help or they couldn't afford it or they were lonely or whatever the reasons are that people could help people. So the community we put together Uh, There were um, uh, interviews at the start, just talking to people and finding out why they want to be there, what it is that they're looking to do. And we created like this little hub. And it was a hub of like, I don't know, 20 people. 
right? That was just a small little hub. And then we said, okay, so in order to support them, what we need to do is every week, and it was on a Wednesday night, I remember for three or three and a half hours, we're gonna meet in the church hall and there's gonna be snacks and there's gonna be food because that's what everybody wants. Sure. And what we're gonna do is we're going to teach them. We're gonna teach through like a pretty good curriculum and we're gonna teach them about certain concepts and get them to do role playing and, uh, this is, and get this, them to practice. This is not necessarily religious instruction, to be clear. This is not religious no. instruction at all. This no. is actually bringing in professional training around counseling and, 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 and like, stuff that you wouldn't find in a religious context. Well, I mean, yes. I mean, I, I suppose if you're, if you're in pastoral counseling, you talk about it all the time, but sure. it was those kinds of, it was actual counseling approaches. So we didn't get into the heavy duty psychological kind of stuff around, you know, psychopathology and this kind of stuff. But we got into things around acceptance and self-responsibility and grace and naturalness and innocence and reciprocity and uh, you know, ordinariness and creativity and environmental nurturance and, and play and humor. Like we, we had like all of these Wonderful. sort of chapters, like modules, and we would talk about them and we would, you know, we would inform them biblically because this was done for church. But we could also inform them, you know, if, I mean, we could have done it through any of the holy books, you know, like mm -hmm. tell us because these are very universal so we can inform it. To, to, to show that this is really uh, spiritual as well as it is psychological. And through the role playing, there was always a supervision that was being done. And after a number of modules with enough supervision, and enough role playing, etc., we decided that it was time to let some people loose, right? So, okay, you're ready to go. And, you know, the word was put out there. If you just want someone to sit with you, if you just want someone to talk to you, like it was never advertised as lay counseling. Sure. It was just, look, if you need a companion, if yeah. you need, a, you know, a sounding board, we got people who are happy to meet you and do that. So people started calling in and we started sending our folks out. And uh, the re response to the program was quite extensive to the point that we started getting people knocking on our door saying, wait, I want to do that. I want to do that. And so we started growing and growing and then we had multiple cohorts. And by the time it was at its apex, we had 300, 300 people. Am I saying that right? Yes, 300 people showing up on Wednesday nights to learn how to do this. It's basically a conference every mm -hmm. Wednesday night. Well, and, it, and it's, it's not just wonderful for the people who were on I mean, the receiving end of the ministry, the folks who are getting visited, but um, the formation and professional skills that are being given to, to members of the community that can then also be transferable out into their professional lives, right? Like, um, like an, uh, true edification and opportunity and, uh, and community building. It's, it sounds, I'll tell you, if there are people in my network who are interested in what you did, I hope they reach out to you, JP, because it uh, sounds, like, uh, sounds like you did some good stuff there. I think well, you know what? Let them reach out, and then, and then you and I can put something together. You know what? I would, I, you and I would do, a, would do a hell of a workshop together, wouldn't we? We definitely would. That would we would. Up. Can we, uh, can we do a couple rapid fire questions? I've been, uh, rapid I've been fire. Oh, okay. So I'm on the spot. Okay, go ahead. So I've got a, I've got a couple for you. So, okay. um, let's start it off. Let's start it off with Marvel or DC comics. Oh, you're killing me. I think I got to do DC. Oh man. Superman. Superman. I, oh, I was raised with a man. What can you say? On screen or uh, stage? Stage. Demi Moore. Oh, and I thought forgot the other person I was going to say. So we're going to skip it because I totally forgot <laughs> who I was going to say. Well, then definitely Demi Moore. Demi Moore. <laughs> <laughs> if it's Demi Moore or nothing. <laughs> Psychology or theology at the dinner table? Psychology or theology. Oh. You're killing me with that one. I think I'm, you're killing me on that one. <laughs> See, like, like that's the toughest question, probably because they're, they're, they're the same thing to me. Uh -huh. I think I have to say first, first, oh, 
Well, right now it's more psychology at the dinner table. So I'm going to go with that. I got teenagers. <laughs> I thought perhaps that it was uh, because your, your lovely wife, my, my good friend Courtney, um, yes. is, is in the midst of her, her psychology degree. So I, 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 would, I would imagine it gets put on the table regularly. Let me put it this way. Psychology at the dinner table, but storytelling always. Love that. I love that. that, that, that we'll, we'll end rapid fire with that. I like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, so I think of you as a real Renaissance man, brother. You, um, you are able to oh, converse and live in a lot of different worlds, which is something I, I think is really cool. Um, but one of the things that I'd love you to share, um, because it, it's, I know it's a big passion for you, is, uh, is, is, is the work you do in the theater. And you've, uh, you function in a whole bunch of different ways. I'm going to uh, tell us about your last project and maybe what, what your next project might be. Well, I can't tell you what the next one is yet because it's secret, but I can tell you where we're going. But when the day comes, listen, I'll tell you what, when the day comes where there's going to be a big announcement, you and I can do another one of these. We'll announce it right on the show. I'm going to hold you to that. You, you okay. know, you know, yeah, I yeah, yeah. it's going to happen. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, theater is uh, theater and art. Theater music is a big part of my life. It's it's yeah. it's it's in my bullseye. Literally, it's it's it resonates with my soul. Right. And so um, part of what I'm doing, I've always dabbled a little bit in the arts. Twenty five years ago, I was doing it professionally and. Uh, you know, I was doing it here and I went to New York and I did the whole thing. Uh, and then I decided to move in another direction for a bunch of reasons. So now I'm in a place in life where I'm kind of looking at the second half of my career, right? I'm kind of yeah. thinking, what do I want to do with the second half of my career? Do I, do I want to keep doing what I'm doing or do I want to add something on? Like, do I want to have a passion project? So I decided a passion project is good. So I am now one of two executive producers for an up and coming theater company that's going to hit Toronto in the fall of 2022. We are currently planning, we got our seed money in, so we're, we're, we're on the road. We're planning a big extravaganza downtown Toronto. Can't tell you who it is yet or what it is yet, but you're going to love it. Uh, and the hope is not just to do one show, but to create a theater company that will then do, you know, first of all, annual shows, but also have other uh, tentacles and start doing things within, you know, the festival world and, and the orchestra and music world and, and the concert world. And the reason is that um, I kind of got frustrated. Like one, one of the things that COVID did for me is it really made me kind of look, look in the mirror and say, okay, what do I really want to do, right? Uh, which I think everyone has done that. And Again, I heard a voice that said, yeah, but you really like the arts. So, you know, true to the dogma of don't close the door, go with it. I'm doing that. Um, but also, I got a little frustrated that I didn't think there was enough art that had a truly Canadian voice. Mm. As, you know, I, I, I don't know, like there used to be a lot. You know, yeah. back 20 years ago, it was everywhere. Like, you know, yeah. we were known as like Broadway North and, mm -hmm. you know, we were like a, a hotbed of creativity and innovation and new shows and our shows would start here and go to Broadway. And it was, it was, it was a thing. And then all that kind of died away for a, a bunch of reasons. And since then, we've kind of had the same couple of things going on, none of which are in the city. We've had, you know, the Mervish subscription series that tends to be mostly road shows from the U.S., and then you've got Stratford and you've got Shaw and they're far away. And so I got a little frustrated thinking to myself, you know, maybe there's an opportunity to allow Canadian artists to, again, in a really powerful public way, like big, obvious way, you know, speak their voice and flex their muscle and, and show their beauty and inspire and, and maybe kick up a bit of an artistic renaissance where, you know, if we do it really well, maybe somebody else will pop up and say, yeah, well, we're going to compete with you. Well, that's great because now two of us are going to do it really well, right? And then we'll just keep that world kind of juggling until we get to a place where our spirit is alive again. Like, how great would that be? So we're kind of working on it. That's what we're trying to create. It sounds like you're re you're ready to lead us into the roaring twenties, man. Where you? Because I feel like that's there is going to be a resurgence of art and culture on the other side of this uh, of this pandemic. Because 
I know so many, so many actors and people involved in the theater world, uh, people involved in the artisan world that are, that are out of work right now, right? Like that, yeah. that because, um, but I also know that in every era where we've gone through war or famine or pandemic, some of the great books have been written, written out of those eras. So, so some of the great, some of the great plays. So I, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what's on the other side of this in so many ways. And I, I, I imagine people who are listening and hearing what you're talking about are, if, if they don't get excited about you getting excited, like I, I've, I've been around <laughs> you when you're getting excited and I just watched you right now. So there's a lot of passion there. Um, yeah, I get really excited about that. Really, really. <laughs> JP, it's been really good to talk to you, brother. Um, thank you for taking the time to come on and, uh, and, and share some of this. Uh, we kind of jumped from a few different places. Um, but I know for a lot of people listening, um, I've talked to a lot of folks, not just church people, um, but as folks who are missing community right now. And mm -hmm. the thing that they've commented on is some of these kind of like public conversations about things uh, just reminds people that people are thinking about lots of stuff. Um, and if they see familiar faces, it's nice too. Um, so uh, uh, thinking about uh, your family this week, uh, some of the folks you can and can't gather with, with pandemic stuff, but uh, happy Easter to you next week. And uh, thank you. It's been good to have you here. And to you, my friend. To you, my friend. Uh, I hope it's a blessed weekend at least. And I really hope it's the start of the new year, so to speak. Definitely. You take care, man. Talk soon. You'll be well. Thanks. Take Bye. care, buddy.